perspective. Great. I'm glad you joined. Thank you. Who else do we have, Kelly? And then Mike Borman. You want to introduce yourself? Yes, hi. Can you all hear me OK? Definitely. All right. Well, my name is Mike Borman, uh, civilian. Um, I'm just a neighbor, regular uh, neighborhood uh, resident here in Rockford. Um, my house has the uh, fortune or misfortune of being uh, located uh, in the PFAS area. Well, it's actually technically just outside the boundaries of the PFAS area, but it's next door to a uh, an old uh, uh, dumping site that Wolverine Worldwide used to use uh, way, way back in the day. It's called a Stoll Gravel Pit, right, right on 12 Mile Road near near um, the White Pine Trail. So my interest in this group is uh, maybe a little bit for selfish reasons. Um, I kind of want to uh, get get water, uh, hook a municipal water hooked up to this part of our neighborhood, which Algoma Township was talking about doing and then they said there might be a chance it's not happening after all if they don't get enough residents on board and so it's kind of been uh, back and forth but I, I kind of want to learn as much as I can about stuff like this so well, glad to have you you came to the right place <laughs> thank so, you and, and Mike I, I think you should tell the story about who knocked on your door right to talk to you about BFAS. Yeah, that was I was out doing yard work and it was uh, uh, Macintosh, Lynn Macintosh. Lynn Macintosh, the one and <laughs> only, right? Mike. Yes, yes. on my bicycle. It was one of my little bicycle by roads. Yeah, I use all means, mostly avoid <laughs> technology. I'm, it's nice to see you here, Mike. Yeah, well, I'm glad. Thank you for letting me know about this group. I, you know, like I said, I'm just about a year and a half I've lived in this neighborhood and you know, slowly learning, learning things and uh, just trying to educate myself about these, you know, important water matters. My house has never um, tested positive for PFAS, you know, above the limits, above the legal limits, you know, it's like three or four parts per, what, a million trillion, whatever, but, um, but it would, boy, it would be nice to get city water running through, running through our houses here, so, uh, but anyway, okay, I'll shut up. <laughs> All right, well, glad you're here. I'm glad you joined us. That'd be um, so this time, Kelly, I think we're going to do roll calls, but we talked about maybe as as um, communities, if you're representing a community, maybe when you do the roll call, if you're here, if you could kind of just share a little bit about what's going on, if there's any new events, new updates, uh, new things that you're hearing, um, we're going to use the roll call as kind of an opportunity to to share all of that. So take it away kelly yeah so if you don't mind we'll start with jason um jason do you have any community announcements regarding pfas in your area uh no new sites in the area um very little in the local papers and things like that so no current or i guess updated news to really share with the group thank you and i marked you down for being here and Mike Borman, how about you? Uh, yeah, no, nothing for me. I'm sort of brand new to the group, so uh, yeah, just just uh, just sitting here to uh, listen and learn. <laughs> okay, and Brad. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm represent uh, the Lansing area, the West Lansing area. And as far as I know, there's nothing new regarding the racer sites that are nearby. And also anything new that you might be hearing in your community or anything like that, any, anything that any of us would be interested in hearing, please share. Honey Boris. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I represent Wayne County along with uh, Teresa Landrum. Can you hear me or not? No? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, I represent Wayne County with Teresa Landrum. We have discovered we have now 13 PFAS sites and counting. Uh, we all have areas of interest, so she and I are teaming up to work on four different sites which are in southwest Detroit. You know southwest Detroit, it is the most heavily industrialized area, I think, in the entire state of Michigan. 
So we want to know what our exposure is. So we're going to be working on site. We're going to start with that, then we'll do the east side of Detroit, and then we'll do Western Wayne County. Uh, so that's it from our end. Thank you, Connie. Dan Brown. Hi, uh, this is Daniel Brown. Uh, for those uh, new members, welcome. Um, kind of hailing from the Ann Arbor, Whitmore Lake, Huron River Watershed area, and I'm a watershed planner with Huron River Watershed Council um, uh, in my day job. <clears throat> uh, we had a very busy couple of months. Uh, so for those of you that have been following the news, we were hit with uh, a potential hexavalent chromium spill, which really put you know, everybody in our orbit into crisis mode. Um, I, I won't go into a lot of detail on that, but but happy to you know um, chat with anybody about about you know that spill in particular. But what was interesting about that event was that it came from the same polluter in our watershed, uh, Tribar Technologies, which is responsible for you know the past PFAS contamination, which has the Do Not Eat Fish advisory on our river. So a uh, lot of interest in. Uh, toxic chemicals generally, what we can do about hexavalent chromium, uh, but it also reinvigorated interest, you know, across the board uh, about, you know, holding polluters accountable, what can we do to address PFAS contamination, why are these things used, uh, so it, you know, restirred up all those, those older questions. Um, one thing I'll just share <clears throat> really quickly is uh, because it was the same polluter, same spot in the watershed, um, and, you know, it, it reactivated all of our contacts and a lot of the information and kind of lessons that we'd learned from working with members of the COG and, uh, you know, the network we've developed um, throughout this group and other environmental groups was just really valuable, especially early on in terms of getting ahead of the crisis. So, um, you know, it, it reiterated to me the value of you know being involved with groups like this but also you know just developing relationships with you know other environmental orgs uh, around the state um so won't, won't go into more detail on that take up more time but um a lot of lessons learned happy to chat about it with with folks as you want to thank you mary blanchard I'm here and in the Holly area, we are undergoing a work plan um, of spending $100,000 with uh, the site lead. Uh, we have not actually seen a copy of the work plan yet. It's supposed to come to me through the site lead, but we haven't received it. Um, we did miss an opportunity, unfortunately, with the manufactured home community. They came up for their permit for the wastewater treatment plant. And even though they uh, published it in November, the actual um, comment period did not get posted until May. And we totally missed it because it was uh, published in my waters after the point of 60 days. So that's what's happening in Holly. Thanks. You. Rick Rodisky. Um, Rick Rodisky, I'm with Grand Valley State University and represent uh, Ottawa County. Uh, there's uh, one PFAS site that's been in the news a little bit. It's the uh, Harbor Island site. It's in Grand Haven and it's the site of a former uh, coal fired power plant that's been torn down and they wanted to build a gas fired power plant on the site and in the process of doing uh, uh, environmental assessments they found uh, PFAS in a number of the wells and it's also uh, a little bit of detections in the Grand River so um, lots of uh, not not lots but there's news articles about it and I'm trying to find uh, somebody from the Grand Haven community to to join our group I think that'd be beneficial um, other things, I'm on an international PFAS call once a month, and uh, we had a good session on uh, breastfeeding and also blood testing. So if there's any interest on the group here, um, I've got a uh, 
link to a uh, new article. Uh, it's a peer-reviewed journal article about uh, breast milk and PFOS. And then there's also some new guidance on uh, blood testing from the National Academy of Science. Um, and it's a really good uh, discussion. It's uh, designed for uh, designed for the public, but also uh, it's something you can take to doctors about uh, getting your blood tested. I know in Michigan, uh, insurance doesn't cover it, but it, it really lays out a good case for if you've had an exposure that you should have your blood tested. So um, anyway, that's my update. Thank you. Bill Barnett. Hi, everybody. I'm from Cadillac slash Wexford County. No updates here. It's been pretty quiet in this neck of the woods. Thanks, everybody, and welcome to the new members. Thank you, Gail. Man. Am I, can you hear? Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. I'll, I'm Gail Dugan. I live here in Otsego, Michigan. I represent, along with Pam Queer, the Southwest Michigan uh, area, uh, Kalamazoo, uh, the um, uh, Allegan County. Uh, we have a project with the parchment epidemical of the study that's going on there. Uh, sorry, I slaughtered that word there. Uh, we also have in Otsego Township a water sewer project trying to uh, get clean water to people where uh, one of our local manufacturers uh, uh, got a lot of PFAS out in the farm fields and we're in the process of uh, getting that cured and uh, waiting for the uh, rest of uh, the input from Eagle and the EPA uh, on that uh, as to results from the testing that they are doing right now for legal proceedings. That's all I have tonight. Thank you, Gail. And do we have Gail um, Manchewitz? See if she's on. Don't see her. How about Sandy? I'm here. Um, I'm Sandy Winstow. Welcome to the new members. Always glad to have more folks here. I am uh, in Belmont, Michigan, across the street from the Wolverine Worldwide Dump as well. Um, we are in the process of uh, finalizing, I guess, or they're in the process of finalizing their work plan to cap, I don't know, 20, 30 acres of a dump site. And so we have a CAG meeting on Thursday that I think we're supposed to hear what was finally decided about that. Um, so that's kind of the update in that. I'm going to try and find the National Academy of Sciences um, thing that Rick was talking about because it is pretty impressive. And I'll put it in the chat when I can find the link. It's a really large document. It's only like 300 pages, but you don't have to read all of it because I think what you're looking for is on page like, I don't know, 36 and 37. So I'll find it while we finish up here and throw it in the chat. Sandy, did you have anything for the Great Lakes PFAS Action Network as well? Or oh. Are we going to do we're going to do that later? I could do that too. Um, I'm also a co-chair of the Great Lakes. Oh, Rick, you you showed it. There you go. Way to go. Um, I'm a co-chair of the Great Lakes PFAS Action Network. We um, just got done re-granting some money to community groups um, around the state. I think you'll hear more about that as it comes up. So that's kind of exciting. Um, we're looking at doing some air testing in Wayne County and Flint. I think we're doing some water testing in some different areas of the state. I can't keep track of them all. We've got some in Illinois in the Chicago area and Milwaukee area that we're looking for some things. So um, that's the update from GeoPan. Thank you. Shalene? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Sorry, I'm using new earbuds, so trying to get into the new technology. Um, so I represent the city of Bay City, specifically a PFAS site that's listed on Middle Grounds Island. And we are working on our pilot test for remediation using uh, injected colloidal carbon. 
Um, we've had to move our pilot test around a little bit. And so we just got issued an injection permit for that second round of pilot testing. Um, so we're anxious to see the results of that. But we're we're in the remediation phase, I guess, for, for our particular site so far. So that's my update. Um, thank you. And Tony is next, and I believe he's not able to join tonight. Teresa. Good evening, everybody. Teresa Landrum, Southwest Detroit 48217, uh, specifically the zip code of 42217. Um, as mentioned earlier, Connie and I are collaborating on doing some educational workshops down in the Southwest Detroit and Dearborn area. Um, we are home. So, Teresa, we're losing you there. Can you hear us, Teresa? Anybody else here? I no. think we lost her. Okay. okay, Teresa, we'll come back to you as soon as we can hear you again. Stacey Taylor. Don't see Stacey. Charlie. Thought Charlie said he wasn't going to make it. Okay, I didn't see it. Um, Dave Wynn. Yep, uh, I represent the Ascoda area for the former Wordsmith Air Force Base. Um, currently, the Air Force is working on uh, firing up two GAC systems on on the base. Uh, one for the FTO2 site, and the second one at uh, Air Force Beach. And from, from what I understand, it's starting, it's going very well. Um, they're also in the process of looking at some additional IRAs while they're finishing up their remedial investigation. And uh, next Tuesday um, is we have the Ascoda Town Hall, uh, which we have typically every three months. Uh, looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. Joe. Hi, I'm uh, Joe Kang and living in Ann Arbor, drinking Ann Arbor water. Thank you. Elizabeth. Lynn McIntosh. Hi, this is Lynn McIntosh in my beautiful backyard. Too bad you don't have the crickets, but they're beautiful when they come. Um, yes, I live here in the Rockford area, and I. the good news I'd like to share is related to Eagle, and that's that Karen Vorse has been promoted to be the director of mediation. And Karen has, has done so much good along with Abby here in our Rockford area. So I'm, I'm very happy about that because um, I'm not very hopeful about our, our company, Wolverine Worldwide. Um, Sandy referenced the plan to cap the site across from her, and I look at that plan and I'm thinking, and there's no requirement for them to um, filter the water just before it's, I don't know, over a mile away where that awful plume goes right into the Rogue River. And I'm thinking, it's been five years, and what do you have to do to get this company to really do something that's going to make a difference uh, besides the absolute minimum? So for those who are new to this, it can be very discouraging to be in that hurry up and wait phase for a company to finally get around for a pretty, pretty good average, I guess, solution to the problem. Hard place to be but we're plugging away at it. It takes perseverance. Um, I don't know how others feel about it. I was going to recommend to to Mike, our new member, um, that the Wolverine tag does need someone from Algoma on it, and that's going to be really where the rubber hits the road, road too in terms of working to get municipal water to that area. 
Yeah, and it's also education there. People just don't understand that. So they, they don't want to switch their wealth over to municipal because they really don't understand the situation. So I, I feel for you that on my, uh, for you on that one, Mike. Um, I had a great vacation this summer going out east. Niagara Falls was gorgeous, saw it for the first time. And I could not believe the amount of churning white foam going over those falls. I was with a friend and I, I, I tried not to look at it. I have got some photographs of that falls that were just like, it's just, once you know it's PFAS swirling around there and foaming up all around in there and you see, you see the boats going in. Uh, there's a, I forget the name of the, of the boat that brings people close up to the falls, but I opted not to do that. Because, I don't know, was in that water coming down there. So I, I continue to bump into it and, it and it's hard. And yet this group is, gives me hope that we're moving forward and making a difference. So I, I appreciate everyone who keeps attending and, and our new members. And um, I will be signing off from my backyard here. Uh, if I do leave the meeting, I will join later by phone, depending on how uh, long my iPad stays charged. So just so you know. All right, thanks. Thank you, Lynn. Mm -hmm. Rick Burns. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, this is Rick Burns. I live in Hamburg Township, Michigan, which is in Livingston County. I am the chair of the Livingston County Solid Waste Planning Committee and involved in local environmental issues. And during my day job is an environmental consultant. Um, so I, what I've been tracking, of course, is all the Huron River information that Dan Brown mentioned earlier. And most recently, a lawsuit filed by a beef uh, farmer, uh, I believe in the Howell area, that's suing Tribar because his uh, beef is contaminated uh, from biosolids applications is what I understand. And uh, he's seeking some relief, which is a big story around here. Thank you, Rick. Tyler. Bill Creel, I know he's not able to join us. Christina. Daniel Burlingame. David Norwood. Jeffrey Dutton. Jeremy Welsh, Justin, Ken Harvey, Laura Ogar, Leah, Margaret, Matt, Pam, Patty, and Bob. No. We haven't seen Bob in a while, so, okay. All right, well, thank you for the updates. I think that helps round it out for all of us. Um, how about if we run to subcommittees and give us an update. So let's start with, I think it's you, Rick, for the engaging the public. Is Rick here? Yes. We, yeah, we had a uh, brief discussion about the notification time and we've agreed to uh, try and uh, sit down with uh, Abby and Kelly and talk about uh, you know, what's an appropriate notification time and the possibility of involving uh, some of the townships in terms of finding out information about property owners and distance from, you know, a parcel. They have digitized tax records. So we're going to have a conversation about uh, notification time in the near future. 
All right. I think that was one of the things we talked when we had the big meeting before was kind of ironing out some of this. So keep us posted on that. Yep. Um, all right. Website review committee. Was there anyone on the website review committee? Do we still have a website review committee? I was just talking. <laughs> I was <laughs> muted. <laughs> oh, OK. Um, <laughs> so Bill um, wasn't able to join today. Uh, we did still meet just to kind of give high level of the changes that um, we made to the website and to let them know that um, we're working on updating the work group pages by the end of the year and also looking at updating our FAQs by the end of the year. All right. Cool. Thank you. Um, prevention measures subcommittee. I think that's you, Dave. Yep. Um, we've got uh, we've we're at a point right now where we've got the what we think is the final draft uh, for the community awareness information. And I want to thank Kelly for all of her all of her help in helping us get the um, URL links for the for the different areas of the MPART website created and and documented. Um, so Kelly, I want to thank you personally for all your help. So um, the we're at a point right now where we want to get the the information um, out to the Cog in order to have them take a review. And we also, uh, we met last week, uh, Thursday with the group. And um, we'd also like to talk about possibly setting up a beta site uh, to be able to use this information for somewhat, possibly a, a new community that's just experienced PFOS to see if if the information that's in here is, is um, effective in, in helping them uh, understand a little bit lot more about PFOS. Um, and then the other question that we need to talk about with possibly Kelly, you and Abby um, is keeping this document updated. Um, you know, I, I would be more than glad to update it uh, on a quarterly basis uh, because I'm sure as we go through, there's going to be a lot of continual information and updates as we go through it. Uh, but again, that's something that uh, the subcommittee would like to know from an MPART standpoint is how we want to keep this document updated and also where is it going to be housed on the MPART website itself. So those are three <laughs> items that uh, uh, we'd like to have further discussion about. But uh, I want to be able to send this out to the COG. So my question is, Kelly, do you want to send this out to the COG or do you want me to? How do you want to do this? My hope is was that you would send it to the COG and okay. collect the comments or suggestions okay. or anything. Yep. Um, nope. And then no we, we can meet to discuss that. Um, but if okay. you can coordinate that, that would be awesome. OK, I can do that. Um, can you send me a list of the emails? Uh, maybe just send me an email with all the people's names on it or email addresses so that all I need to do is attach the document and send it out to the group. You know what, yeah, Dave? I, I, actually, I actually did that today. So when I sent out the meeting okay. materials, everybody that's in the two list, with the exception of Abby, Amy, and I, I believe, um, that is your COG member list. Okay. Everybody in the optional is not, they're not COG members. It's just extra people from different agencies that we've added in there. Okay. So just the top people in the two are, is the current email list. OK, Sandy, you had a comment? I was uh, a couple things that I was going to say. You could just use the uh, email list. But uh, two ideas I have is one, since we have two new members, uh, let's use them as experimental test bunnies and have them look at this document and see if they find it helpful. Because uh, we were wondering what it would be like for people that maybe haven't been 
involved in the cog or, you know, so that's one thought if those two people could look at it. Um, the other thing is this has been such an incredible project for Dave and Kelly both, I mean, have done just an enormous amount of work. So I, I don't want this to be like, you know, the never ending project that we never get to do anything with. Like let's, let's, unless there's glaring issues with it, I'd like to like get this going so that new communities have a resource. Cause I think this is a really good resource document for people. So those are just my thoughts. And I believe the next step, once we have the document finalized, um, we're gonna try to send it to um, see if we can have some graphics kind of add, added to it to make it kind of a more appealing document for when you print it and hand it out. We'll see if we can actually make that happen or not, but that's Perfect. the plan. Okay. Kelly, I will get a I will get a meeting scheduled for so we can go through the rest of these issues. Great. Sounds good. Um, and then Mary on the membership committee. Hello. Uh, the membership committee um, had two tasks this month. Uh, we finished up the member survey. I sent a copy to everybody last week and I did not receive any new, new um, surveys. So um, I guess we'll consider this complete at this point. Um, we did have 14 people respond and it seemed to be a pretty good consensus, I think, that the leadership um, coming from the citizen or the citizens group itself uh, seems to be working well for uh, the opinion of the people who responded. Um, the other thing that we were tasked with uh, was checking into the possibility of adding new members and uh, Daniel and Joe and I did um, exchange emails uh, regarding that. Um, one of the things that I had considered and talked to Kelly about was going through the sites individually and looking at the contact person to see how we would reach citizens in that area. And Kelly pointed out that it's actually not the citizens or the municipality that's um, listed in those sites. It's actually the site lead who would not have that information. So um, we're gonna be back to the drawing board as far as trying to figure out how to best uh, reach community members in those areas. So. Um, we would welcome anybody who would like to join in that effort. And um, we'll be meeting over the next uh, month, either by email or phone or whatever, and uh, trying to come up with some uh, better ideas on how to do that. All right. Mary, did, did we talk about the number of members that don't typically attend meetings? And, you know, and when we were... We did touch on that just briefly. Okay. Um, I think that right now the feeling was is that as long as they're not taking a spot for somebody else that might like to join, because um, Kelly was pointing out that it's either two people per site or per county, um, that that might be a problem in the future. But because we are not uh, currently uh, over the limit, although um, in the area of uh, Rockford, Bel Belmont, that uh, Kelly did just have to rearrange a little bit to uh, have Mike, I believe, join the group. So um, we are going to be discussing that further in the future, but uh, for right now, um, we're going to leave it as is. Okay. I'm just bringing that up because I know we're going to talk about voting in a few minutes and that's where it gets all muddled. So um, yeah, but I'll I'll let that go. All right. Okay. So I think um, well that brings us to the voting procedure. So Connie, are you still here? Yeah, I'm still here. Let me know if you can't hear me because I've been having trouble with the microphone lately. Um, we we uh, can hear see. you. Okay, good. Um, let's talk about the voting procedure. 
Uh, we had to work on basically following Robert's rules of order, but not to the T because we don't have to do it to the T. And because our members, the folks that join for each meeting varies at every meeting. Now, when you have to vote on something, you have to have a majority vote if you want it to pass. So the key issue is how are we going to do that? So the way we're going to do it is Kelly will give us the number of POG members who are present at this current meeting. So Kelly, what's the number? We have six, 16 people on okay. the roll call. Okay, now I don't know if we're taking minutes or not, but if we have 16 people, a majority vote is one half plus one. So it would be eight is half of 16 plus one is nine. So we vote on this voting procedure. In order for it to pass, we would have to have nine AI votes or yes votes. And the way the voting procedure works, now we uh, I should say one other thing. In the future, one of you can not be in the meeting, but you really want to vote on something that is up, what you need to do a couple hours before the meeting, you need to uh, have somebody who's going to attend the meeting be the proxy for you. Then you will email that someone's is going to be my proxy at this meeting. You, you uh, email it to the person who's going to vote for you and to the leadership team two hours before the meeting. So even if you're absent, you can still vote using that procedure. All right. Now, the way we vote on whether or not to accept these, this voting procedure which was sent out, uh, I think uh, you did that, Sandy. You sent out the voting procedure as well as the agenda, and everybody has this. So all you do is somebody who's interested in making a motion, they raise their hand, the chair, Sandy, will recognize it. If another member seconds the motion, and the motion is seconded, and the chair restates the motion for the five members to say, here's the motion that we're going to pass. For example, in this case, somebody would say, I move that we accept the proposed Empire Pod voting procedures, our voting procedure from this day forward. Somebody will second that. Sandy, you repeat what that motion is. We have discussion on the motion. And after everybody's been discussing, the chair calls for a roll call vote or raise their hand. Now, a majority, like I said, is real simple. One half plus one person. Uh, there's other voting uh, procedures we could use, like the two-thirds vote. Um, then that would be two-thirds of all the people present. That's rarely, rarely used. You only use that when it's something really dramatic and it's really going to affect the cause, like disbanding the cause. You would need a two-thirds vote to do that. Um, okay, and a tie vote, we have a tie vote, half and half, well, then it doesn't pass because it's not the majority, so it hasn't been passed. All right, so what we need here to uh, address this one is we would need for someone to make a motion about whether or not we would accept the MPART pod voting procedures as outlined in the attachment you received from Sandy. Okay, I'll make the motion. Nobody else can do it. I'll make the motion. I move okay. that we accept our pod voting procedures as written in the attachment provided by Sandy when she sent out her email to us. Is there a second? Mary has her hand up. Mary, are you seconding or are you just asking a question? I am seconding. All right. So I guess the motion is uh, we're going to do a roll call vote or are we supposed to do discussion? Is there any yeah, discussion or can we go straight to a vote? Hearing nothing, we're going to go straight to a vote. All right. So, Kelly, can you do a roll call vote on 
accepting the voting procedure as written. Yes. yes. Jason. Yes. Mike. Mike Barman. Did we lose our new member already? Uh, he's on, but muted. So Mike, if you're on, maybe you can unmute yourself. We'll come back to him. Brad. Uh, yes. Connie. Yes. Daniel Brown. Yes. Mary Blanchard. Yes. Rick Rodisky. Yes. Bill Barnett. Sandy. Yes. Shalane. Yes. Teresa, do we have her back? Yes. Gail Dugan. Yes. David Wynn. Yes. Joe. Yes. Lynn McIntosh. It's so close, but yes. Richard Burns. Yes. I think uh, we I have our first passed right. vote. I think we have a unanimous decision. OK, finally, we can vote. OK, yes, thank I'm you, voting. Connie. No, you're I'm welcome. Voting. Sorry, guys, I'm voting yes to Barnett. <laughs> All right, thanks, Bill. OK, we got that done. Thank OK, you. so we should say 15 to 0, it passed. There we go. All right, now we got a score. OK. Um, Abby, I think you're next on the end. Oh, Lynn's got her hand up or she's applauding. I don't, Lynn, do you have your hand up? My hand is up and I'm also applauding. This okay. has taken a lot of time and work on behalf of the Voting Procedures Committee. And I, I'm very grateful for the work they've done. We were in a whole different place a year ago for those joining on. And this is, this is just wonderful. So thank you, that's it. Thanks, Lynn. Mm -hmm. All right, Abby, you guys wanna give some updates? Yeah, and I will run through in an effort to conserve a little time because I know we have a speaker tonight and we want to make sure we give him uh, adequate time. So a couple of things that are on the horizon that I'm working on and um, and trying to keep everyone involved. So I'm going to be passing out some additional information as we get it. But there was $5 million set aside in the legislature for what they're calling residential drinking water sampling. This will be money that uh, EGLE will be uh, granting to local health departments to assist with residential drinking water sampling. We're still looking at how to implement that program, how exactly to give it out, how um, to, it would not be just for PFAS, it would be for all contaminants, could be nitrates, could be arsenic, could be lead, could be all kinds of things that we might find in our drinking water wells and so a PFAS would be a piece of that but when you start dividing up five million dollars by 83 counties um you know there's yeah. going to be some considerations that we're looking into on uh which which counties have the most drinking water wells which counties have the greatest need uh environmental justice considerations all those kinds of things and so we're we're looking at what that program might look like and how to implement that so more to come but it is an opportunity. I think it will segue in dovetail in very nicely with um, some of our statewide efforts for residential well sampling and education. Um, so we'll have more about that probably at our next meeting. The other thing I want to really put out there is we've talked a lot about um, uh, 
affected communities. Everybody here is associated with an affected community in their area. There is a lot of money coming into the state through infrastructure money through the um, a variety of different acronyms names associated with the federal infrastructure packages that are coming through. Um, one big pot of money that we need to really get the word out, and I'm going to ask you guys to help hook up with some of your local community um, uh, drinking water supplies, is that we've got our drinking water state revolving funds. We'll be funneling a lot of this money through that program. There is um, about $18 million that will be coming in this year. We had a little bit left over from last year, so it'll a little bit be over 18 million, but it'll be for um, drinking water improvements. So it could be hooking up uh, additional neighborhoods to existing systems. It could be hooking up individual homes. It could be more uh, drinking water supply improvements, construction, that kind of stuff. Uh, the intent to apply application is very short. It's one page for the community, so it's a very uh, short window, but it is due November 1st. That will be for communities to apply for FY24 funds. So not funds this fiscal year, but funds for next fiscal year. So 2024. Um, so if people are working with their communities or, or know of communities that potentially might be applying or would like to apply, um, we can drop that. Um, that link is on our Eagle website. We can drop that in the chat so everybody's got it as well because that's very important for people to know. There are a couple of other um, uh, funding sources that we're looking at, one being the EPA's uh, funds, $5 million. It'll be $5 billion going across the country for um, uh, small, small and disadvantaged communities for PFAS. And so that too, we have submitted a um, intent to apply as a state. And then we will be um, probably getting additional details from EPA exactly how to go through that process and get additional information and applications from them. They, that is not going to be through the um, DWSRF funds. So that um, in the SRF fund world, you have to be an existing system. Um, in these EPA funds, it'll be um, new. It could be new construction of new systems, which will open the gates for a few other communities, especially in those disadvantaged communities. So we're looking at, at that closely and we'll get some more details and plan on following that up. Um, so Michigan's got a chance to apply for those. So just know that that stuff's coming on. Another thing that we're working on is doing some additional outreach and training for our local health departments. We have 42 different, 42, 45 different local health departments across the state that handle all 83 counties. Um, they are not equally trained, they're not equally staffed, um, and many, many, many of them have had significant turnover uh, in the last few years due to COVID and, and other um, staffing issues. So we're gonna work on talking with them. They've desired a, uh, an expressed a desire to do that. And uh, it's a wonderful idea, obviously, to get everybody back on the same page. So that we'll be working with them on that. Um, the other thing I'll mention, is there's a lot going on with EPA. Um, EPA has two major initiatives. One that you guys saw in June was the um, uh, interim lifetime health advisories for PFOA and PFOS being very, very low. And then the other one here is for um, rulemaking, proposed rulemaking for making PFOA and PFOS uh, hazardous substances under CERCLA. That too um, has started, that is in the federal register right now, and they will be opening that up for public comment. What I understand is that um, that'll be the first public comment period. The second one will be asking the public about um, their thoughts on listing additional PFAS compounds besides PFOA and PFOS. Um, and so there'll be a public comment period about that. This will be, um, 
this will help us bring in and be able to ask all of those federally uh, regulated sites to also look at PFAS. Uh, we will still have the ability to um, require use of state standards as an ARAR, uh, but we, you know, in the case of if it's a if it's a Superfund site or a DOD site, perhaps um, it'll just be easier if uh, if uh, PFOA and PFOS will be circular hazardous substances under that program. But like all good things, it will have a rigorous public comment period. I'm sure there'll be lots of um lots of webinars and other things about those updates so we'll keep our ears open continue to gather additional information the information i've gotten on that has been pretty um limited so far uh, but they do expect at least the time frame that we have been told is that probably by august of 2023 they want to have all the public comment period done and be into final rulemaking with the PFOA, PFOS for um, as hazardous substances under CERCLA. So um, that is, those I think were the big things for EPA. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Yes. Um, okay, and then new sites. Since we haven't met in two months, um we do have six new sites and so um uh, we've done local official calls with all of these some of these are coming uh, in through our um uh, groundwater discharge programs uh, that they have permits for groundwater lagoons or groundwater seepage uh, through lagoons as in the case with some of these smaller wastewater treatment plants. Um, so let's just go through them real quick. Hydro Extrusion USA is, um, uh, I think actually that one had a fire and we discovered that they did have some PFAS in that one. Caledonia Wastewater Treatment Plant, small uh, time wastewater treatment plant that has PFOA. 104 North Kinney is the dry cleaner. Kelly, am I right on that one? That's our dry cleaner. I think so. Yes. 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 Um, Rockwell International, Bishop Airport, and Delphi Plants um, are all additionally on there as well. So uh, nothing too unexpected with those. Um, and so we'll continue to move. We've got more in the hopper to do, uh, just trying to keep our keep everything rolling. So let's stop there and see if anybody's got questions. So I think Shelley, Shelley had a question. Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks. I'm used to using Zoom, so I didn't see a hand button. Um, so going back to the grants, Abby, yep. uh, I know I know some years ago, um, many years ago, there were grants for landfills. Um, is there any consideration being made with all of this legislation being passed and grant money rolling out? Um, obviously the focus is drinking water and that makes perfectly good sense. Um, but in the meantime, in the kind of in the back room, landfills are having to do a lot of cleanup um, and municipalities are paying a lot of money to do these remediation projects. And in Bay City alone, this is a, a potentially $3 million remediation that's gonna be on the backs of the taxpayers. Um, is there any consideration being made or is anybody talking about the potential assistance to municipalities that have landfills to help them out, even though they are, quote unquote, potential, potential liable parties because, you know, they owned the landfill? Um, mm -hmm. Certainly at the time, we didn't know about PFAS, you know, 40 years ago. Um, but is there any discussion going on at any level to help alleviate the cost of the municipalities when they're trying to do the right thing? But they also can't put $3 million on the back of the taxpayers. The great, we, we need, great we need help. Question. Okay. I have not specifically heard about anything like that, Shelly, but I also haven't asked the question. So let me do some more digging and see if I can answer that question specifically. Most of what I've heard about is for um, grants and loans for specifically for drinking water. But let me ask the question about that with our grants and loans people and see if they know of anything off the top of their heads. I appreciate it because we're being held to the same standard as drinking water. So our groundwater in the landfill is being held to the same standard as drinking water. So my landfill 
is being held to the same cleanup criteria, even though I don't have a drinking water impact um, and I don't have a public um, safety impact from the landfill. But I'm being made to clean it up, which is fine. But the cost of cleanup, it, it, it's going to bankrupt our municipality. Either mm -hmm. that or we're going to have to press it on the taxpayers, neither of which seems like the right answer. Yep, yep. Yep, it's the rock and the hard place for sure, Shelley. So let me do some digging and see if I can find anything specifically. Um, and also see if some of these these grants can be used. I know there seems like there are some innovative grants for maybe for some remediation, but let me check and see what I can find. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yep, good comment. Thanks, Shelley. Other comments or questions before we move on? I'll call on Sandy. I yeah, that feels better if somebody else calls on me. Um, a couple things. Were there people that needed to be notified? Did we have to do public notification for any of these new sites, or were these not threatening private drinking wells? All of these sites um, were checked for uh, uh, private drinking water wells to make sure we had, in some cases, there were um, drinking water wells that were being sampled uh, or that were scheduled to be sampled. And I'm looking at this list. I'm trying to think. I don't think North Kinney had any. I don't think Rockwell was right on the river. Bishop is already assessed. Adelphi is assessed. It. So I think, okay. I think all of them, the Hydro one, I'm trying to remember, Kelly, I think they looked in a mile radius and didn't find any drinking water wells, I think is where they were on that one. Okay. Um, but that's part of the normal standard processes that we'll always assess. So we have, we want to have that question answered before we even meet, even before we talk to the local officials so we can say, okay, we're either actively um, reaching out to them and going to sample them or we've assessed and didn't find anything. Um, so okay. that's like one of the first steps that gets done. Okay, and then I know Tony had emailed me with a couple of questions, but given that we have a guest speaker, I'm going to just hold those till the end or something so we can hear the next part because because I'm just going to. Yeah. So I think that's a right. great idea. We can put it on next month's agenda yep. too. Mm -hmm. All right, so I guess with that, let's have our guest speaker this person came uh, I should let Rick do the introduction or something I was going to say Rick Rick should do the in introduction I can do that um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, John Yelich from the uh, Michigan Geological Survey and we uh, started to communicate when I, I heard about the uh, triage program and, and that's a uh, kind of a desktop analysis that um, the Michigan Geological Survey does for uh, MPART sites. So if um, they're going into a, a new site and they want to get some uh, idea of groundwater flow, they can do a, a desktop uh, search that involves, uh, you'll, you'll hear all this from John, but it involves looking at uh, the well logic database, that's a database of uh, well logs and then trying to uh, triangulate and get an idea of groundwater flow. And um, in our conversations, it, it uh, it's a much complica more complicated issue and it kind of dovetails into the idea of trying to prioritize residential drinking or public or private drinking water wells for uh, PFAS sampling. So. Uh, I think it's really good to hear about uh, what the, the the work that the Michigan Geological Survey does. They're not usually listed as a uh, partner in the PFAS process, but they're very much invested in uh, providing uh, geological information for decision ma decision makers, and they they do a lot of assistance to uh, to MPART. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce John, and he can. Uh, present on uh, the fine work that he's doing. Rick, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to use my screen because I have a whole lot of animated things I'm going to do. So let's try and do this. 
it's going to work slow because I have a Internet service called Frontier, which is pretty dismal. So you have the screen. Not yet. Uh, we minutes. did. Now it's gone. <laughs> OK, hold on a minute. Did you does it take a minute to share? Yeah, and that's what I said. Frontier just works so slow here, so I put it on full screen. Unless you, yeah, you can see. Let me do the. Oh, wait a minute. I, I see what I did wrong. Hold on. It's thinking about it now. Coming, it's coming, and okay, just there hit it there. It goes hit slideshow. We should be good. Yay! Hey, let's clap. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, All right. We got that. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Okay, I, I'll tell you what. I, if it's okay, Abby, I'd like to give just a brief background on my, myself uh, on this. So, absolutely, uh, double, go for it. Double double graduate in geology from Western Michigan University. Uh, half a century ago. Uh, so the the thing that I'd like to say is, is that I've worked uh, in mineral exploration development permitting, but then uh, back in the 1980s, I don't know if you've heard of this company or not, Union Pacific, uh, they're a little railroad. Uh, I set up a consulting company for them and I ran it for 12 years and, and Union Pacific leased all of their lands. And guess what? Every one of them was contaminated because everybody did something they weren't supposed to do. And this was just at the time that CERCLA came in. And so I had a consulting company with 70 people working for me out of Boulder, Colorado and Houston, Texas. And we cleaned up in 20 states, but we also followed the major consulting firms because what we tried to do is to evaluate the cleanup that they were doing and making sure that the railroad wasn't paying more than what they should have. For what they were doing so we evaluated technologies and cleanup for example we cleaned up downtown las vegas and 300 acres we cleaned up where the denver the colorado rockies play it was an old railroad station we cleaned up san francisco where there's a railroad station we cleaned up where the los san francisco san jose sharks play that was part of railroad and we cleaned it up and they turned it over to brownfields and so we were cleaning up and had an environmental assessments, but the thing is that I've worked in 20 states and clean up, and I also permitted landfills, hazardous waste landfills. So now when I come back to Michigan, I at least have an understanding of what we're doing. And one of the things I'm going to say is, is that I came back here nine years ago and my situation was, my gosh, we're not dealing with data. We're dealing with just information. And, and that's what I've been working on for the last nine years since I've been here. So with that, you're going to hear some of my really strong points about we really need to have science. And that's a word that has not has been used lately, but wasn't used when I first got here. Use what we have because we don't have money to do anything. So having said that, what's Michigan's most critical natural resource, both in the lower peninsula as well as the upper peninsula? And Believe it or not, folks, there are a lot of people that don't know we have an upper peninsula. They thought it belonged to Wisconsin. So anyway, that's water. So Michigan's glacial geology in the lower peninsula is it's not uniform, and that's both vertically and laterally. And what does it contain? Well, it contains all of these valuable substances, which is groundwater, surface water, aggregates and wetlands, and they all come together geologically. And what do we know about the geologic and water resources in many areas of Michigan? Almost nothing. And that's one of the things that I became acutely aware of here. So water is Michigan's highest societal and economic resource. And then science, a word that resonates today, but wasn't used when I, I've got here, but now it's being used more, but we still need to use it. Water has never been scientifically quantified. And by that mean it's geologically. We've never looked at it geologically. It's all been waving our hands. Total amount is unknown. How much do we have? Yet Michigan has signed national and international agreements stating its water resources are understood. Michigan has not committed submission funding to scientifically assess or quantify this resource. Water issues by county. Michigan's lower peninsula, about 60% of the water is from glacial sediments. What's so important about it? Well, first of all, there's no scientific database that's even validated or, create or corrected geologic data that's in databases. Many programs use well logic, which is drillers data. And 
So I can't be doing this because I was doing a presentation. I asked you to raise your hand. How many of you have used well logic? And so I'm hoping that some of you raise your hands and say you have because I'm going to be talking about it. First of all, well logic is used for wellhead protection. It's also used for groundwater levels when we look at uh, certain areas of contamination. It's depth to bedrock where we have drilling that has actually penetrated bedrock for our aquifers. And then the water withdrawal assessment tool. This is for high capacity well use and how much water we're using actually and are we going to impact all of our streams. Well logic was never location validated. When they started well logic in 2003, there was never any kind of validation of this X, Y. Is it actually where it's supposed to be? OK, so many uses of this well data from 2000 to present. So the economics of our water is water and aggregates support all seg segments of the Michigan economy and they occur together. Water supports growth and development. For example, Pfizer, there's 17 million gallons, approximately equal to the city of Kalamazoo. And I just was talking to somebody in the next few days about that. This just came up just literally today. And what this thing just, Frontier just slowed down on me. There we go. Water supports agriculture. Aggregates support the infrastructure of Michigan. Michigan doesn't have any data programs to delineate the location of the water and the aggregates. Michigan has never compiled any geologic data for water or aggregates into any database. And for too many years, Michigan relied upon inadequate and in unvalidated information, not real data. So I call it kicking the geology can down the road. And so compliance with the Great Lakes Compact was needed back in about 2000, and that's all the other Great Lakes states plus our sister country, Canada. Michigan Water Division in 2006 accepted a software program that incorporated unvalidated water well data. Developed groundwater inventory mapping. That was a data of all the other data that had anything to do with water. GWIM compiled data on watersheds, drainages, interpreted water values, actually put conductivity and transmissivity. That's how much water does that formation hold and how fast does it go through it? And they use that with not valid data. WIM program is claimed to be a robust program that based on unvalidated data and uses Krieging to make the data look smooth. Krieging does not make data correct. It just looks good and provides estimate. And this really isn't mapping. And this is one of the things that I've been talking about for the nine years that I've been here. So Michigan update on results. There's no validated scientific data was available local or statewide that we could use. We developed a groundwater inventory mapping program, which everybody said, well, this is the information that we need. Well, GWIM was used to support the water withdrawal assessment tool, which is high capacity wells and groundwater withdrawals. Did anyone work on Watt and GWIM have any geologic field experience? Well, I know that at the time when this was done, there were two geologists. One of them still works for Eagle and the other one is now retired from USGS. They were kept out of the discussions. And so they were not involved in the discussions back in 2004, 5, and 6 when this was being done. The Watt was claimed to be a scientific approach that there was no scientific data collection or validation. It was screening only. And this is what I had been talking about since I came here. It's a screening tool. Well drillers logs. When they looked at the well drillers logs, the well drillers had 5,000 different terms for the lithology, the material that was in the subsurface. They combined that to 188 terms. And they also gave it scientific values. They gave it values for storage coefficient, how much can it store, and transmissivity, how fast does the water move through it. Both the K and T are not scientifically factual in GWIM, the Watt, or other because of how it was developed. Michigan claimed compliance with the Great Lakes Compact and GWIM is no valid geologic data, nothing but look good estimates. Do not have a program to input geologic data to what? And that's one of the things we're working on now. I sit on the Water Use Advisory Council. We're trying to get real data into the Watt tool so that we can assess where potential water impacts are from high capacity well which oils. The other important thing is drillers were never trained in data entry. So all the drillers could do whatever you want. What grandpa told them what to do and what dad told them what to do, that's what they did. That, those are the terms that they had for what they were doing. So there's a common th Michigan theme, no scientific data. And that's one of the things that we started seeing and we're seeing more and more over the last until probably what I'll talk about now. How does Michigan begin to understand the water resources and the economic value? Simply put, 
we need to produce what we call surficial geologic maps, and this is with 3D geology. This is looking at the geology from surface down to the bedrock or the complete sequence that is our water resources. Stop using unvalidated data. This starts with validating the water well drillers database. MGS, Michigan Geologic Survey, Sufficial GD Mapping, we're documenting now the wetlands, discharge and recharge, where they're at on our maps. Sand and gravel at the surface and subsurface. Water is in sand and gravel. And wherever you have that wherever sand at the surface. That. Excuse me. OK, had an echo. OK, wherever we have sand at the surface, that's a real in issue because we do not want to put industries, which we have in many places in Michigan, near river channels and other things where they could impact the drinking water supplies almost immediately. We also looked at the depth of bedrock so that we could look at the whole glacial package or the whole water resource package. Groundwater levels in produced documents and the resulting in the corrected well hair protection areas. One of the things that's really key is that when a water well is completed and it's put into well logic, that water well data is at that point in time. So when that well was competed, that's the water level. So that's a data point in time only. All geologic data has economic and societal value, and then well logic data cannot produce validated map products. You have to look at the data and then see what you can use out of well logic. So there's no factual data. Unlike Canada and our adjoining states, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, they're all using geologic databases and water databases. And also to give credit, Eagle right now in the last 10 months to a year is now going to establish a database for geology. And I applaud them because that's exactly what we need. What if Michigan continues to rely on non-factual data and continues to delay inputting factual data? Well, here's an example of what happened. Is that back in 1819, yeah, 2018, 19, not 19, okay. PFAS is identified in selective water wells. So the question was, where do we sample? They went to well logic. So it tells the state to find the wells. Well, they weren't down gradient. The wells, in many fact, of the area, they were a mile away from where they were supposed to be in a location, and it wasn't down gradient. So the state had to go to Google or send people out the field to locate the wells to sample down gradient from the well that had impact. Just a brief review, a little ge geologic review for you. The Michigan glacial geology is perhaps the most complicated and discontinuous lithologic units that we've ever been recorded. There are multiple stages of ice that came in. They started in 200,000 years ago down to less than 10,000 years ago. The glacial movement coming out of Canada and coming down Lake Michigan this way and this way coming from Huron and coming from Erie has resulted in various glacial deposits and they include aggregates, water bearing sands and glacial moraines which have the most important term glacial till and it's not in the only database well logic till is clay sand silt gravel everything and it contains nothing of economic value there's no aquifers or aggregates in it and it is predominantly the major unit we have but it's not in the drilling logs 2011 is when the michigan geologic survey was if you will transferred over to western michigan university for 30 years, nothing happened with the survey, and it was as a result of work with Hal Fitch, who was the uh, state geologist at the time and working with Western Michigan, said we need to come over where we can really do geology with people who are mapping glacial geology, and that was Dr. Alan Kiyu that was doing it, but we also had Dr. Tom Straw, Dick Passero, other people who were working on glacial things. But the whole premise under 67 was provide scientifically validated research and data to look at our natural resources, discovery and management, act as an independent unbiased authority on geological matters underpinning Michigan's natural resource production, and then provide and preserve for geologic records that can support the natural resource decision makers public. Well, guess what? They transferred it and they didn't bring any funds. So when it transferred in 2011, they didn't have any funds so that we could function. And so Western provided two years of funding. And from that point on, I've been raising grants and other things to keep it going for the last seven and a half nine, to eight years. Michigan is mandated to compile geologic data and was the only Great Lakes state without an annually funded geologic survey until July of this year when we received our first annual funding. So where do we begin? Here's a map that you can get on GeoWebface and it's just a summary map. 
Well, this is a map that's used by the regulatory body, consultants, the MIWAT, decision makers. This official map was actually developed in 1915 by Leverett and Taylor. It had minimal changes in it in 1955 and 82. And all it represents is the major glacial features, surficial features in Michigan. And that's what it is. That's all that we have. And it's the role of the survey now to provide the updated mapping that we have in priority areas. But this is the map that everybody uses. So I just want to compare something that there was federal dollars that were available back 25 years ago to start mapping. Illinois looked at what we call priority impact areas. That was high growth areas around Chicago, all along the interstates and everything else. They received over $4.9 million in federal funds to map. That was matching dollars that they could go ahead and map. And they mapped about 30% of their state. Indiana went after it too, and the blue areas right here, those are also high impact growth areas. They received about $4.2 million. And they had about 178,000 a year. About 40% of the state was mapped. The difference with Ohio was is that Ohio had money coming in from energy and mineral production. So there was about a penny per ton for sand and gravel production, and then was something from oil and gas. But they had money to start mapping, and so they mapped it a little bit differently. Rather than mapping something that was 55 square miles, which is a quadrangle, they started looking at county mapping. And this is a program here that I really embrace because it tells you where the problems are, and then you can come in and focus later. So you get as much done as possible. And in that period of time, at 25 years, they have 80% of the state mapped. They got about $3 million from the federal government to help do it. What did Michigan do? Well, first of all, they didn't have anybody to do the mapping and they couldn't chase the money. And so they received only about $1.7 million at the time. And the mapping was done around Lansing, where they could drive out from Lansing and get to these areas because there was no expenses or anything else for them to do the mapping. We had about one point seven or about seventy two thousand dollars a year. And then just a quick comparison with Wisconsin and Minnesota, three point seven and two point eight. All the data that we provide, all the data that the survey provides is open file. So that's completely different than consulting data that goes into files that you have to then do a FOIA request. I won't go down that path, but most of you know what FOIA requests are. So in 2018, MGS proposed a triage data summary for areas had by PFAS. This is when they first started coming up. Well, what's the problem? Well, the PFAS contamination has been identified in waters of the state. Additional locations are, are likely to be identified. This is 2018. So they decided, let's look at geologic and hydrologic data that will help identify the risks and to formulate the decisions. We prepared a scope of work. Uh, along with some Eagle people, when we did it, we said we'll develop a map of a water table, flow directions and recharge, and look at the discharge relationships. Also look at 2D geologic cross sections. That's slicing down vertically and what does the geology look like and then looking at it with depth in 3D, uh, well depths. Looking at the screen intervals, where do they get the water? And you'll find out when I, and right now I'm hoping that we can do a secondary presentation where I'll show you some of the things we've done with this. But static water levels and lithologies and bedrock surface. Bedrock topography. Some areas have bedrock that actually seal the aquifer from the bottom, and in some places we also have the bedrock as an aquifer. And so that's part of what we did and we're proposing wherever we did this study. Using LIDAR, light detection and ranging. And those of you that are not familiar with it, LIDAR has been a blessing for the mapping in, of geology for all state geologists throughout the state, the, the country, is that it helps us to go look at things and we can see it because it's not 10 meters, it's down to less than a meter that we can see differences in elevation so we can look at features. And that means that we can go out and just field check things that we see, and then we can say this continues. We don't have to walk all the outcrops. We don't have to walk all of that. So identify data gaps and databases and data for, from Eagle. So that's part of the process that we had in supporting additional understanding of location. And then submit a summary report with supporting documents, figures, and data. We proposed a phase two, which was compiling additional data and reports, phase three, which was perhaps additional technical data for a more thorough report. And then in August 18, MPART revised the task of budget for a rapid assessment of locations impacted by PFAS. And that's what we did. That was the phase one. So we selected two to five mile radius assessments of the locations provided by Eagle and their consultants. So in September of 22, MGS is only completing phase one in some of these, but that phase one provides that information in that two to five mile radius. And that's also when we were looking at the water well logs in those areas. And that's when we also realized that they were not where they were supposed to be. 2019, we continued to provide triage summaries to MPART and 
project revision in 19, we began to correct the well logic locations because we were able to show that in these, we had a high percentage of the wells that weren't even in the right section, let alone the right county of where they were at. We also had paper logs that drillers had not submitted and we inputted all that. So we continue now to provide triage specific location geologic water summaries. And with that, MGS started hiring students. We had them working on computers and other things beginning in 2018 and 19. We had a standard training program that we we're doing so that they could go ahead and put all of the corrections for the locations. And then we also had all of these standard logs that need to be input. So in 19, we continued to do the triage summaries. We continued to provide MPOT with the locations. And then we then hired additional students. And then working with Jeff Reichert, who is the Kalamazoo Health Department, and John Ashram Eagle, we started looking at parcel viewer and how we could try and locate where the houses were to come up with a faster way of validating the well logic locations. And from that point on, we have increased tremendously in our efficiency and effectiveness in locating the wells. So the, we locate the land surface elevation, well depth, depth of water, and this is for Eagle when we do our reviews so that we make sure that we have all the data that we need. So MGS has a formal training and continuous QA and performance review program for our staff. And that training program is, is that if a person doesn't do quality work, we give them 60 hours to correct, and if they don't, they're let go. So we have a project manager and a system manager that review all the data and they do test QAs on everybody's work. That way we know that the data that we're doing is going to be correct and we don't have to worry about it. And I'm going to give you some examples. So here's a summary of well logic. Over here we have the well logic database from January of 21. These are all the glacial wells as are termed. So and then well logic has all the bedrock wells. Well, lo and behold, we have 183,000 wells that nobody said what it was. And so that's another issue that we have. What, where was a well completed? What was it that we have? So MGS is also inputting. If you didn't know, there's a database that the state has in well logic, over 700,000 scan logs. These are from the 50s to 2003 when well logic started. And the total between the two of them is about 1.3 million total logs. And right here, I just wanted to say that right now we have completed about 42% of the project. 503,000 of that 1.3 million now have been validated and or input into well logic. In our training program they began, I started training well drillers, which they hadn't been done. And I do that every year right now. And that's getting drillers so that they're consistent and understanding what it is, which by the way, I also, and we'll be doing it here in just a couple of weeks, up in Ross Common, we review training of how to log cores with all the geologists that work for Eagle. And so I've been doing that for the last three, last six years, every two years we do that. But the training program from the well drillers is to make it consistent. So then just as an example, Allegan and Ottawa County, we've located all the well locations and we did that in 2020. And this is in here because we're mapping right now, Ottawa and Allegan County, we're mapping in detailed geology. And so the only Michigan database that has subsurface data, 40% of the wells in well logic are not correct, 40%. This is a summary table that I provide to Eagle every quarter. This just tell us what we're doing this particular quarter, how many, which counties that we're working in, how many wells we've done, and how many are incorrect. Here's scan logs. These are the wells, the older wells, 1950s, that were put into well logic by other people. Of that 17,000 in the last quarter, 97% were wrong, had the data input incorrectly, and that's the data that everybody was using. And that's what we're trying to correct. And this past month for these counties that we're working in, of the 21,000 logs that we reviewed in well logic that were already there, put there by the drillers, we had 51% error. It's one of the highest error quarters that we've ever had. But here's the summary for the whole project as we sit right now, is that we have about 274,000 logs in well logic, 39% of them were not located correctly. We have the scan logs, how many were actually input in the system, 93% had incorrect data. And here's the total number that we have that are now correct in the whole program. This is a map that we prepare right now because we have priorities that have been provided to us by, by MPART, but also by the water division. And so this is where we have the well logic locations. These reds indicate that the county is essentially done. We have corrected all the wells in well logic. And then these are the percentages that we have done for that. 
This then represents a summary of the scan data. This is the data that's in the database well logic, the 700,000. These are the ones that we're completing here and input all of the scan logs, and we're working in priority counties in this particular area. This is a summary table that we provide, and back in 2018 when we first started, we were given four sites to try, and uh, these are our demonstration sites that we did. And so there were a couple of airports that had some issues, and we and I'll talk about those the next time, but this was looking at how we could put the data together, how it would be presented, and how it was received by MPART, and we worked out all of the issues of getting the data to them correctly. This is, again, the summary right here, and the these colored ones are actually government or, if you will, airport facilities that we've done. This is just, and then we were asked when there was a big changeover and looking at the changes in the qualifications, we looked at 37 sites in one mile radius just to find out where the potential impacts were and we provided that. So the total summary that we've done since we started in 2018, we've done about 67 locations with somewhere between one mile and a two mile radius when we've done it. So I have to update my map, Abby, because uh, this is the map that I have that shows right now, but the point that I'm trying to make here is this is where Michigan Geologic Survey has done mapping. This, of course, is where all the PFAS locations are located. And then these dots right here, these are the counties that the high capacity Watt tool needs to have the data done. And so these, uh, this is a combination of all the information that we have. But we have the PFAS, which is soils and water. And then we have multiple locations, multiple locations throughout Michigan. And then where Michigan has open file subsurface data, that's the mapping. And what's wrong with this picture, of course, is that we just don't have it in a lot of the areas where we need it. So the red and the black outlines represent MGS mapping products. Then we've got the outlines that I just talked about here from the water withdrawal tool in this area. And then MPART has 46 counties that they provided to us to saying that they wanted to have that mapping done. We have another database out there, and this database right now is a 201 contaminated facilities, as well as the leaking underground storage tank sites 213. That data was all in paper, and so anytime that you want to do something, you had to go look at it, and everybody had to. So the, the water division and the state is looking at new methods right now, and they are putting together some data compilations, and Eagle is not, excuse me, Eagle's now working on a database on the geology for some of this. But this is where some of the other data is located that we can look at. And then the other map that I haven't shown is that we have, what is it, 70, I think, active landfills out there. They have monitoring programs that they've been doing, and that's where we also should be able to get a water analysis, particularly on the upgrading side, to look at that. So the total summary of the project, Well Logic is the only Michigan database with any subsurface. Who uses it? Eagle, DNR, MDART, all state departments, agencies, counties, consultants. The well drillers use their own data and they also complain about it. Engineers as well as citizens use the WellLogic database. Until the locations were validated, WellLogic was a guess for small areas. What is important about the data to mapping is that it's the location, water levels, dates, lithology, lithologic terms, depth of screen, that type of thing. That's what we use when we're trying to put in our maps. This is just a summary table that I have right here, but I think what's key is these are recommendations that came from Eagle Water Division as well as Eagle Empart, as well as United Tribes. Michigan Geologic Survey has been meeting with the tribes for seven years, almost eight years right now, and we have a recommendation from the, the tribal nations. The only state in the Great Lakes area that all the tribes have agreed to, we need mapping to understand our water resources, and that came from the, the United Tribes of Michigan. And so we've got approximately 20 to 25 counties. That number could go up what we need to do. We've got four counties right now that have 3D mapping that's completed, and so with that, I'll stop right now and answer any questions, but that's just to give you a summary of where we are, what we need to do, and what we've been trying to do with the WellLogic triage program. Well, I feel like I just had a crash course in geology. <laughs> I, My head I is spinning, <laughs> but you did great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to call on people because hopefully they know what's going on. Um, let's see who who's got their hands up here. Mary, no. Yes, yep, Mary. Mary did. Okay. John, thank you, thank you. We had uh, in Holly a geologist who was working diligently with us, and I know that he would vastly appreciate getting a copy of your. Um, segment, would you be able to 
provide that or no? No, you can have you can have this segment right now. What we did, and this is something I hope is acceptable. I was going to cover what we showed on each one of the sites, and it may have been too much to digest in one meeting. <laughs> and so I well, it was very I, quick too. <laughs> it was quick, but I'm just trying to show that there were critical things, and we're fixing it. And that's okay. the real blessing here is that we're going to have it fixed so that we can use the only database that we have now. So the answer is yes. Kelly does have that in uh, PDF so that uh, she can mail it out to everybody so that you can have it. Thank okay? you. Thank you very okay. much. <laughs> Wonderful. Kelly, uh, I'm sorry I put the burden on you. <laughs> she loves it when we do that. Um, Rick. Yes, um, I saw that you have that uh, 201 map and I was wondering, is that a map of all um, like monitoring well arrays for contaminated sites or? Actually, what that is, that is a derivative of Environmental Mapper, which is on the uh, Geo web face. It's, excuse me, it's on Eagle's site that you could go ahead. But I had some people go ahead and just plot all the sites on because when you okay. go to it, you just put your cursor on it and it'll tell you something about the site. Okay. I just had one of my student students compile everything and that sure. that's about three to four years old, but it just shows the distribution. OK, well, what happens to all the uh, monitoring well data? Um, you know, if there's a, uh, a uh, you know, a, a site, a, a plating site or, a, you know, a landfill that has uh, monitoring wells put around it, there's obviously, uh, you know, lithology collected. Um, where does that go? Does that go into your database? I, I no. And this okay. is something that I did uh, five years ago, and I'm trying to remember the RRD person that was in charge. Abby, help me here. Who was the person that retired five years ago? That was oh, the RRD. Uh, Mike Jerry probably remembers. Mike, help us out. I'm trying to think of who would have done the. All right. Uh, just a summary. The Sarah Pearson was working in Grand Rapids, and she had scanned all of the data from all the RRD sites there. She shared that with us, MGS, and then we looked at it and I had two students looking at how we could try and capture the data because if you wanted data on any site, you had to put a FOIA request, freedom of information request in, and you had to then wait for them to get it out. At that time, they had 10,000 requests a day, um, a year, and that meant that it was about three man years of time to pull that data out and provide it to you if you had that request. And what Sarah did is she scanned all of it and we were trying to come up with a mechanism that we could pull out the geologic data only. That's all that we wanted because you had a geologist usually logging, putting in the wells and that information. And then we were going to try and establish a database that didn't get any traction because I went and talked to all of the water division people about five and a half, six years ago, and they said no time, no money. And so now I think that we do have the time and money to do it and Eagle's working on it. We are. But the bottom line on that, Rick, is you have to FOIA request every site and then you have to go through the files because some of these files may have, if, if you will, a thousand pages of nothing but correspondence. And then you have to find the report and a map. And the other thing about the maps are the maps are usually by a reference point. Some of them are by a telephone pole or by a fire hydrant. And that's the way that they're located. And so you have to be able to say, is that where the site actually is? So having worked in cleanup sites many years ago, then seeing what we have here, we're trying to come up with a better system of being able to make that data so that you can use it, but it's not open file yet. Okay. Long well, answer, I'm a, sorry. Yeah, that's a great uh, resource to try and tap into because I, uh, you know, I'm reading all of the uh, reports that are generated by Wolverine and they have, you know, all sorts of well logs and stuff. And, um, you know, somebody's going to have to put together a uh, a geological map. I mean, they're already putting it together and saying that, you know, it's not their problem in certain areas. But I, I would like, you know, an organization like yourselves to uh, to get that data and be able to uh, to use it. So, um, no, I. Uh, Thanks for the work that you're doing, and I'll probably have another question a little bit later, but I'll let other people ask, so go ahead. Right. Neil, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, being a commissioner on the Allegan County Board of Commissioners, I uh, wanted yes. to go and just make a comment here. Uh, we are working with John and his group to uh, get 
uh, the colony of Allegan uh, mapped and uh, correct because we know how much it is a very much a concern to make sure that this data is correct and that we can go forward with good data. And we appreciate the work that he's doing. We're in phase two here in Allegan County. And I know the Board of Commissioners really uh, approve and uh, appreciate the work that John and his group is doing for us. Thank you, John. Gail, thank you. And uh, let me add just a bit of detail. In our mapping program right now, the Michigan Geologic Survey does coring. And so we actually take core samples and other things. And the second part of it is, is that we are then putting in monitor wells when it's done so that we are looking at clean sites, we're looking at the geology, and then we have a complete log of the whole stratigraphic section in that area. And the two places we drill in Allegan, and I just finished last Thursday, is Trowbridge at the Trowbridge Town Hall and at the Allegan County Community Center where the human services offices are. And we put a well in there. And the process is that we want to be able to monitor the water systems in that area for water levels only. That's what we're looking at, is just looking at how the water levels are changing with time. And so that's what we're doing in concert with Allegan County. We're doing it with Ottawa County. What I hope that we can do is we can start moving forward and do that with all the other counties. And that can then go into a monitoring network, which I think Jim Mill and his people in the water division are working on too, just to kind of put that out. So, Gail, thank you very much. And I, I appreciate the efforts that Allegan County has done to help us to do this. You're welcome. All right, uh, any other questions here? I think Dave Wind had his hand up. Dave, you took it down? No. Oh. <laughs> it's up again. Okay, go ahead, Dave. Um, in looking at the map that you had there, it looks like the, most of the mapping you're doing, is, it looks like is either on the west side or in the, I'm gonna say to the mid part of the state and below. What's going on to the, to the, to the northern parts of the, of Michigan. Are you guys looking in those areas? And the reason I ask this is that us from Oscoda and Wordsmith, I mean, we're dealing with the Air Force on a daily yep. basis, okay? The monitoring wells, uh, they're in the RI phase right now doing, you know, with all the wells and, and how do they know that the information that they're working with is actually correct when they put their you know, conceptual site models and everything else together? Um, it sounds to me like a lot of that information could be bogus. I'm not going to comment on that. What I'm going to comment on is the fact that for 30 years, the state didn't do mapping. And, and I was fighting to do the mapping in what I saw were critical need areas. Your area is critical. Don't get me wrong. It is critical. And so now that we have a budget, and I didn't tell you, it's $3 million a year that was proposed by Senator Altman. We did get that approved. So that means that now I can start hiring somewhere between seven and nine people to start mapping. And what my purpose right now is, is that we're gonna go to priority areas where people see that they need to have the data. And I showed you that map with the red squares for the water division. I didn't show, the, but the county ones for the PFAS, but the, that's in those areas and Wordsmith's in those areas. So the bottom line is, is that there's every chance that we will have priority areas and we'll single out areas where we'll start getting data together that is validated and unbiased. In other words, this is all the data that we've had and we prove that this is the real data. And so what I hope that I can say is that in a year or less, we'll have data on Wordsmith that says this is good data so that then you can feel good about that. Okay. I'm not gonna go, go ahead. what I was gonna say is I'm not gonna fight with the consultants I'm going to look at the data and we will validate the data and provide an unbiased approach because we certainly don't want to get that way. We just want to say, here's our evidence that this is what we say the data is. And that's what I want to be able to provide everybody and the surveys in other states too want to say it's unbiased and this is what we know about it. Yeah, no, I, I understand and I completely appreciate that. The only thing I'm I'm getting at is that right now the Air Force is in their remedial investigation phase. Okay. And as of as of December of 2023 is when they plan on being complete and then putting together all the recommendations. What I what I what I hopefully I'm hearing you say is that their recommendations based on the mapping could be incorrect. 
based on the data that they potentially are using, that is correct. Because if I were to go back to that map, we did not correct the well logic data in the Wordsmith area because oh, it wasn't a priority. So no, no we, we are going to do it. <laughs> we, uh, we did get we did get the funding and we are going to do it. But what I would suggest right now is that I'm going to go away from this meeting and I will see if I can get some people to correct the data that's in the database in well logic for that particular area because we can get that data done in a reasonably quick time. By that yeah. means, I could get it done in probably two months to have it done. Abby, I'm hoping that, that that this information is critical that can get to Beth Place and Mike Neller because this is, I mean, this is important. They're basing all of their their final remedies and everything else and all the remediation of Wordsmith in the whole Ascoda Asabo area based on that data. And and I'm gravely concerned that that there we're going to have an issue. Dave, I'll comment this way. You have two sets of data. That's the data that they put in. In other words, the wells that they drilled and they should be accurately located because if they're not, they probably shouldn't be consultants. The other is the data that's in the state database well logic, and that's you. That's your personal wells. Are they in the right location so you know whose well is where? And that's the data that we'll address is the data that's in well logic so that we can say that we know where all the wells are in that particular township area. And that supplemental data, that's that helps us fill in some of those gaps. Um, we don't necessarily use the data to try to fill in the gaps for remediation type of things, but when it comes to public and public health and, and potential exposure, we use that data more uh, qualitatively. Um, but yeah, Dave, we have, uh, We'll, we'll, we can get uh, a drink afterwards, and I can tell you the long story we've had about trying to fight for funding for this project, um, and it has really come down to a, a full eagle effort to make sure, you know, because MPART doesn't have this funds, to make yeah. sure that John's group gets the funding to complete this data because it is critical for all of, not just EGLE, but, uh, you know, what DHHS does, what DNR does, what MDAR does, all of the agencies need good data, and um, as John's, you can see from John's presentation, it's critical on so many different fronts that we have this information. So we are knocking on wood. We think we're there. So uh, we're waiting for the contract to be signed. Yeah, uh, we're, we're not going to count it yet, but it's it's very close. Okay, I mean, I I appreciate all your information, and I'm going to take that slide presentation because I. We need to, other people need to see that. And because we need to have, I mean, there's, like I said, the conceptual site model and everything is being created around that data. And if the data is not correct, then that conceptual site model that they're doing their remedial uh, investigation on is garbage. So I'm gravely concerned. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks, Dave. Rick, you had your hand up again. Yeah, I had one one last uh, well, just just a comment and then a question. Um, you know, I, I think it behooves all of us to uh, you know, if we're talking with representatives and uh, people in the government, that we should uh, you know say good things about the work that you're doing and you know support you. you know additional funding. So I mean, that, that's a given. Absolutely. And you know, we, we do have some you know poll in this committee, and I, I think we should all do that because I, you know, it, it's very, very important data for what we're trying to do and what others are trying to do. So uh, just a, a quickie question. I know we, we have this uh, triage or, or desktop assessment, and if there's a PFAS site in one of your red or green areas where you're, you know, where you've got a corrected database, and if, if, if Eagle wants to, to find out if uh, there's a PFAS site, you know, what the direction of groundwater flow is, and they come to you, how long does it take for you to, to do that? Um, you know, there, there's a, a laundry or something in this uh, particular site, and you know, there's what what what's the groundwater flow? How long does it take you to do that? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you what we did, and this is before we had the funding now to correct the wells. Mm -hmm. We would go ahead and correct the wells in that one to two mile radius. Okay. There were okay. some areas where we had a thousand to two thousand wells that we had to correct in there. So that was the thing that took the longest period of time to actually do the assessment for the water levels. And also remember this is that I said that 
when the well was completed, that's the water level at that period right. of time. Right. We know that we are now sequencing these things in about a five year cycle. So we show what the water levels are every five years. A well was completed at this period of time. What's the water level in those wells completed in that five year cycle? So we're putting that in so we show the water levels, how they change over five years. So in that, to get it done, it probably would take about six to seven working days that we would do it. And what I have is because I didn't have staff, I was training students. Well, the students got trained and then got jobs at Eagle. And so <laughs> <laughs> they did. Thank you, because, John. Because I was training them in ArcGIS, training oh, them to do cross sections and other things. So anyway, it's five or six days that we had that it would take to get it done. And then we present a report and then I'd write a summer report pointing out where the, we saw the groundwater flowing, where we saw groundwater divides, because many of the areas had literally divides. And then we had artificial divides. There was one site, for example, that they were pumping the water because it was flooding the underpass. And so it was forcing the water to go 90 degrees from where it was supposed to go. And it was just because they had to keep that underpass dry. So that anyway, those are just some examples that I remember in all the sites that we had done. But about six, seven working days, then we can have a report and it'll be a PowerPoint. And that's what I'll show you the next time is the kind of PowerPoint summaries. And I'll show you the change in what we've done as we've gotten better as putting these together. No, and I uh, certainly applaud you in, in using students in, in your uh, project because you are creating the workers for for, for future workers for Eagle. So, uh, and you've got a nice uh, quality control set up on that too. So, um, no, I um, thank you for your presentation. So, thank you. And we probably got a whole nother presentation on the groundwater oh groundwater table work group, right, John? That's some of the bigger efforts that are going on yep. behind yep. the scenes. John's highlighted one little piece of it, but there's a bigger effort to combine all of this stuff together on a statewide uh, initiative to really get that database and get that information consolidated because of you know all the all the things that John has already talked about. So, um, but that's beyond this group. So we uh, <laughs> we don't have that kind of time today. <laughs> Any other questions or anything? I know we're getting down to the end. While people are thinking, Rick, I want to thank you for bringing John to us because this was really good stuff. I mean, I can see how this having this knowledge, even though I understood about a third of it, and those were mostly the words like and and the and under and over. <laughs> those words I picked up on. Um, but but I think it does help us moving forward. And I think knowing that we're trying to correct the data, you're only as good as the data you have. So that to me is going to make a big difference on public notification and all of that once we have good data. So and thank you, John, for coming and and doing this. It's greatly appreciated. Everybody's raving about you. So this is exciting. This is good. I don't know if people find these kind of educational things helpful to have because we can certainly find others as well. We've got really impressive resources in our state on PFAS and MPART and, um, you know, I'm thinking we've got a lot of top notch people here in our state, so we can probably ask them to come along too periodically. So any other questions for John before we let him go and try and log off of his very slow Internet, he says? <laughs> It is slow. Because maybe it takes him an hour to log off. I don't know. It, it takes 15 minutes to log on. That's how long okay. it took me to log off. Logs off with no problem. <laughs> right. right. You can walk I, away. If I can, if I can echo what Rick had said, is that anything that you can say to your elected officials now and going forward, pre-voting and past election of whoever's there can help because we have to have continued funding. And my merit, the, the work that I'm doing is I'm going to try, not try, I'm trying right now and working with Central Michigan as well as Grand Valley. And I've worked with Wayne State. We want to work with them, University of Michigan. But you're just looking at students that want to work in Michigan. And that's what we're trying to do. And so because virtual has been such a benefit to us, we don't have to have them sitting in the office all the time. And so we can have start putting together programs where they can help work and getting help out there to everybody. So that's what my plan is for the survey. And the survey will look different than what other surveys look because we have other missions that are different than Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. 
and and we've got critical needs and that's what I've tried to sell just in the last six to seven years. All right. Dave, when you got your hand up. Yeah, uh, John, I have one quick question. Yeah. Um, this presentation that you put on today, um, are you able or available or to, to put on a presentation to other sources throughout the state at any particular time? At this particular presentation, I'm able to do that. It's it's ready to go to talk about it because it's one component right now. And I do not say many nice things about Michigan in this, as you notice, because no, I, we just we, we haven't been. And because I was away and came back and I found out, my gosh, we are not like other states that I've worked in. And I worked in 20 states and we just haven't been doing it. And now we're trying to do catch up. And I think that we're going to get it. And Abby brought it up is that we have another program that we're working on that I talked about three or four years ago. And now the states embraced it and now we're going to do it. And so they yeah, found the people said, to do it. As Abby said, there's you also have to have the funding too, which was exactly, and that's right. So and I mean, Abby's everybody's... got a very, very valid point. So, <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, thank you. You're most welcome. Excellent. And remember, um, virtual. I don't have to drive there. <laughs> yes. It makes a big difference. It really makes a big difference. Uh, one quick thing, uh, Sandy, before we get going, um, I will just remind everybody we're going to be doing our um, PFAS, our, our Great Lakes PFAS Summit in December. So there will be lots of opportunities for really great speakers, but we will also be having periodic speakers um, throughout the year in our risk and remediation uh, webinar series as well. So um, we're going to have some speakers coming up on that as well. So anyways, we'll have a lot of good speakers, but if you guys are at all think you want to do some additional speakers like this, let me know and we can try to coordinate on um, some people that I think would be great for the COG to hear about as well. So. By the way, Mike Jury just put a link in there for Environmental Mapper. So uh, grab that. Hi, Mike. Hi, All John. Right. Good to see you. Uh, that presentation. And uh, one thing you didn't mention, John, mention again for folks, how many students do you have working for you? How many hours a week they put in? And yes, you are creating the next generation of geologists, which is super important. But I don't think people, they probably went right over their head how many students you employ doing this work. OK, I have 30 students working for me. And I have more students working than any other department in the university. And they're working on this project and they work at least 20 hours a week on this. So that this is essentially a half time job while they're going to school. They make reasonable wages, 13 to $14 an hour, and they don't have to leave their computer. That's what virtual has done for us. They can work from home and work the hours. And we have the QA program to say if they don't and are not producing quality work, they're gone. And they understand that. And so they work very positive. And then another summary, every two weeks we have a half hour session. And everybody talks about how to do things better and faster. And so we have a team meeting that we do that so that everybody's learning from each other. So I have an excellent uh, project manager. I hope nobody hires her because I'm trying to, Evie Majuria. <laughs> and so she's graduating in December and she's done an excellent job of training and keeping people on the ball. And that's part of the reason that we have a success in getting this done. Mike, thank you very much for, for asking that. And oh, by the way, a third of the students don't even live in in Michigan. I have them in, at Georgetown University. I have them at the University of Arizona and the University of Texas. We put out on LinkedIn for people to do this. We interview them and find the best people to do it. And that's what we do. But we do focus on the students and everything from Michigan. But we have reached out and we have them in other states. I think that that really highlights not only the um, the importance of what we're doing here, but I think the manpower it takes to fix this and why it's been such a monumental task to get it done and why internally within Eagle, we've all um, corralled our resources to really fight for funding to make sure this got done because, you know, we can't handle 
training and keeping 30, it doesn't matter if it's 30 students or 30 staff people going on one project and making sure it all gets done. This is a huge, huge uh, monumental undertaking. And so we we were like, please, John, keep it going. We'll find, we'll, we'll scrape up the couch cushions and find some money for this. Thank you, Abby. Yeah. Dave, do you still have your hand up? Are you just no, waving or? Okay, no, I'm I just, good. thank you. <laughs> I, I just wanted to double check there. So thank you. All right, we have uh, four minutes left. We could get done early, which will be amazing because we were worried we wouldn't have enough time tonight. So everybody talked really fast. I appreciate that. So, um, yeah. how about Kelly? Any last minute things we are forgetting about for next for next I, month or? I do have some things for next month that Tony put on the list. So next month he asked about an update on the fish advisories and were the standards updated. I don't think yep. like the fish advisories, but maybe the data we used to create those fish advisories was that updated. Mm -hmm. So that's a shout out to whoever will do that, I guess, from DNR. He wondered about the notification timeline and where we are with that. So it sounds like Rick is already working on that. And then rule 57 changes. I don't even know what rule 57 is, but I think that's related to the changes in the EPA data or the EPA standards. And are we updating rules about that? So that's just a sneak preview to keep, you know, that's like the cliffhanger at the end of the <laughs> show. So you come back next week. So that is what we have to look forward to at the next yes. meeting. Don't tell the answer, Abby. Make people wait. Well, don't. Don't want look to come up back. what Rule 57 is beforehand. I don't want anybody cheating on no, the test. No, no cheating because we we're going to talk about that. So um, everybody will get a take-home quiz and open book, but let's make right. sure we do it honestly. Um, yeah, we can talk about all of that and more. Okay. Um, if anybody else has other questions that you do want uh, us to come prepared to talk about for next one, get it to Sandy so that we can put it on the list. Um, Cause we always, we, we don't have a problem filling up two hours, but um, it's important that we kind of put them in priority order so we can make sure we get through the list, so. All right, everyone. Well, with that, I guess we're gonna say good night. I just wanted to thank the new members again for joining yep. this group. Appreciate your membership. Yes, yes. Oh, Teresa's yes, got her hand Teresa. up. Teresa, go ahead. I think you're muted. And down. Hey, Teresa, you look like you're unmuted. Go ahead. I wasn't raising my hand. I was trying to get move my button. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good night, All right, well, I guess we're good. So everyone have a good evening. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Sandy. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Thank you, John. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you. Hey, Carol. Yes, Abby.